We have a, a very interesting and high-level panel here. We will be talking about the environmental crisis, which is a very important crisis. But our ar argument is also that it is that all of these crises that we are talking about are deeply interconnected. And we will be talking about the new trends in evaluation also, how, how, do, we, uh, how do we address uh, these things. But our speakers this morning are, are uh, not uh, full-time evaluators, although, although they are people who uh, are very familiar and, uh, with evaluation and what is happen happening with, uh, with evaluation. And, and how to use evaluation uh, for improvement of our programming and improvement of, uh, of how we do things and how we learn, learn things. So let me introduce both of, both of the uh, ladies here uh, briefly. Rosina Bierbaum um, is not only a professor, she's actually two professors, <laughs> uh, because she holds um, holds um, uh, chairs both at the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan and in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland here outside, outside of uh, uh, D.C. I was asking Rosina how to, how to introduce herself and, and she started uh, with the fact that she was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, <laughs> a smoggy place uh, a little bit up the road here. Um, where environmental problems were, were uh, presumably quite um, uh, pertinent already at that point of time. And when you were 11, um, you read Rachel Carson's The Sea Around Us, uh, and that got you hooked on, on, on this issue. I have a cheat sheet because uh, although I know, know these ladies very well, but, but they do so many, many things that I have to check. So uh, Rosina was also uh, the first environment uh, ran the first uh, environment division of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And, um, and she worked with the President Ob Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and, and has been the lead author of the U.S. National Climate Assessment um, in the past. She is also our uh, most direct con connection is the fact that she's also uh, been chairing the science, scientific and technical advisory panel of the of the of the GEF for uh, many years by now. <laughs> and she, uh, Rosina, is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences and and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Adva Advancement of Science the Ecological Society of America and, um, and Sigma C. So you see why I have to cheat uh, here. Uh, I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> Eileen Lee is the chief of uh, programs at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which is, we, we'll hear, hear from Eileen about uh, the foundation, but it's, it's, it's a major actor uh, in 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 this uh, space of uh, environment and, and development, and at the foundation, she oversees all grant making ac activity, including all program allocations and adaptive man management and evaluation as well. And she's been uh, with the foundation for a, a while, also be, having been the environment conservation program head uh, before before this higher uh, position. Prior to joining the foundation, so Eileen was um, an associate principal at, at McKinsey and & Company, and she led client engagements in strategy operations and organizational effectiveness um, across uh, several sectors. But uh, now she also serves uh, on the boards of the Biodiversity Funders uh, Group, the Climate and Land Use Alliance, uh, the Coral Reef Alliance, the Legacy Landscapes Fund, and the Theodore Ro Ro Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. So, a lot, a uh, lot of that. And um, you also hail, like, I believe, from the East Coast originally, but but uh, have been in California for for quite a while with them uh, in uh, Los Altos Hills, uh, where the foundation also works. So, without uh, further ado, so I'll pass it on to Rosina. Uh, you can. Uh, that's fine. 
Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you online. Uh, this issue, as you've already heard, is very near and dear to my heart. And the Jeffs, which is completely focused on global environmental benefits. Uh, but not all of you have environment firmly in your mandate. And I hope to convince you that failing to consider your mission's impacts on the environment and of the environment on your mission may lead to failed outcomes or to outcomes that aren't durable. Um, this picture, of course, is the night sky from space, showing how pervasive human activity is where there are lights and how much we have yet to do to bring development to all those areas without lights, and we sincerely hope with clean, green energy and with equity. On the presentation order, I'm going to talk about three things. First, multiple global reports linking the environment to economic and human well-being and that its degradation is leading to increasing disparity and instability, including the very recent World Economic Forum report, their annual global risk report, just discussed at Davos, where Eileen is fresh off the plane from. You might watch the uh, lower right picture to see the kind of transformational change we need and quickly. I hope it's greening up for you there. The second issue will be discussing the interrelationship and the interdependence, if you will, of biodiversity loss, climate change, intact ecosystems, and emerging infectious diseases. The COVID pandemic originated in the breakdown of our relationship with nature and globally cost us trillions of dollars. And this is not a one-off event. How resilient are we to the next zoonotic disease which comes our way? And then third, I will build on some of the work of the advisory body I chair, the staff for the Jeff. And uh, we've done recently work on climate risk, on nature-based solutions, and on uncertain futures. But I've also read some of your literature, and I'll try to end with observations about what the UN evaluators could consider doing to take greater account of nature than perhaps you already do. There are many drivers on, oops, I never went green for you, did you? <laughs> there are many drivers. Um, first, uh, humans demand more production and consumption. There's climate change, there's ecosystem <clears throat> decline, but of course there's also surprises of which COVID was the most recent, but by no means the only one. I mean, we have war, we have famine, we have refugees, and we need to think about all these drivers together as we pursue a sustainable planet for the next generation. So if you look at the World Economic Forum report, the top five risks from one to five across the top, the last four years running down the side, you see that they're dominated by green, and those are environmental risks. And to a lesser extent, and I hope nobody's colorblind here, um, the red are social risks. So now I'm going to try to lighten up, although I don't, yeah, the climate um, action failure lightened up just a little bit in those greens. That has actually been in the top World Economic Forum risk list for a decade, but it's been in this top five list for all last four years. And this year, for the first time, the World Economic Forum differentiated between failure to mitigate or control climate change and failure to adapt or cope with climate change. Very important distinction that they are now bringing to the surface because climate mitigation has attracted the most attention, but ongoing changes and, those, and the more that are in store need to be dealt with and are an immediate concern. I'm now going to pop up biodiversity in dark print. Um, biodiversity also ranked in the top 10 risks for the last decade, but in the top five, as you can see, for all of the last four years. And finally, in pale green, the palest green to pop up, I'm making extreme weather and natural disasters pop up. Um, so these uh, have been either one, two, or three, as you can see, in all of the last few years. The reds, which are um, infectious diseases, erosion of social cohesion, and livelihood crises, involve things like migration. They're intimately related to disasters and extreme events that are exacerbated by ongoing climate change and the loss of habitat and ecological integrity. Um, we'll talk about this a bit more in the discussion, but let's unpack these risks a bit. 
I don't need to tell you that climate change is having impacts already today at the one degree Celsius increase we've seen. Um, that's why the world agreed to drop emissions by 50% this decade and to get to net zero by 2050 to prevent catastrophic climate change. Well, we are not yet on that path, as you know. Um, but meanwhile, where crops and forests and pests can live are changing, extreme events, heat waves, um, droughts, floods, more powerful storms are all changing and increasing. Sea level rise is increasing. And all of this is wreaking havoc, havoc on communities, on supply chains, and eroding development gains. In fact, as you just see pop up there, new science called attribution analysis can now tease out the climate signal in many of these events. So for example, the incredible record-breaking early season heat that we just saw in Argentina and Paraguay, 40 to 46 degrees Celsius, was made 60 times more likely by climate change. And if you look at all these disasters here compiled by Munich Ray, you can see that the number of weather-related disasters, that's all I'm showing here, have gone from about 200 a year to 900 events last year, costing $280 billion globally, of which 60% was not insured. And I know many of you um, work on infrastructure or need to consider it. And so I just wanted to show early some types of risk from increasing weather. So for a KO, air travel, ITC, OSHA, your mission and capabilities are being challenged by this increase in extreme events. So for example, just this year, we saw asphalt runways softening in 40 degrees C. Um, and, it, and the heat also affects, affects plane takeoff. You lose 1% lift for every three degrees um, in Celsius that's warmer. So now you're going to need longer un runways and on and on. Um, in fact, the scientists, if you look at their big consensus reports over the last few years, the first one on the left is 2001, the one on the right is 2018, where the redness indicates level of risk at what temperature, you can see that now in the most recent report, they are saying red, high risk already at the one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels that we're at today. And scientists fear that we are possibly going to surpass some of these nine tipping points that you see. Complete loss of coral reefs, ice sheets, loss of the lungs of the planet, the Amazon and the boreal forest, disruptions of the ocean conveyor belt. Well, all of those would end up having global impacts. Sea level rise, rapid pulses of carbon dioxide from the lost forest and the permafrost, possibly runaway warming, and massive ecosystem disruption. The very first report between climate and biodiversity experts is this one, and it reiterated that climate change and biodiversity loss are closely interconnected and mutually reinforcing, and ignoring the connection of climate change, biodiversity, and human quality of life will not give us a sustainable world. The, the amount of required land and sea that would be needed to protect both climate and biodiversity are likely to be about 30 to 40 percent, and so we're very pleased that the CBD just agreed on the 30 percent, um, but we're nowhere near that yet. And if you think about trying to combat climate change, if you use resource intensive ways to do that, they can be environmentally destructive on biodiversity, such as thinking about mining rare earths for electric cars and wind turbines. So, so we need integrated thinking um, and transformative interventions to tackle climate change and biodiversity together. Um, it's one thing for me to tell you what the scientists think, but I think it's a lot, <laughs> it's very important to also give you some other messengers, and in this case, the economist. This is the Dasgupta report. They're, they're taking science of, of um, our economy being embedded in nature, not external to it, very seriously. And they 
recommend that we not continue down the path where our demands for nature far exceed its supply. And so, in fact, over a 20-year period, they're saying that produced capital per person doubled, but the natural capital per person declined by 40%, which is clearly unsustainable. Um, it suggests that, this report suggests that introducing natural capital accounting into national accounting systems is a critical step towards making what we would call inclusive wealth a measure of progress. And indeed, Jeff is trying to make 60 countries natural capital accounting ready in the next four years. Um, many other reports now are beginning to highlight the centrality of intact nature to the business world, to supply chains, to human well-being, and to both climate mitigation and adaptation. These are just three of these. Um, but the valuation estimate is that $44 trillion of economic value generation, that's half the world's GDP, comes from and depends on nature and its services. And the latest science reports are indeed telling us that about 25% of our assessed land and um, plant and animal species are threatened, and a million species are facing extinction within decades. So currently, biodiversity is plummeting. It's that bottom gray line that you see downward. So if we want to bring it back up, the yellow line, what we can do with conservation alone is insufficient. You've got to go after those drivers I showed you in the beginning and shift us towards more sustainable production and consumption. So that means lower inputs, including uh, less energy, to get us back to that green line, which shows us conceivably being uh, sustainable again and stabilizing biodiversity by mid-century. This is the same time we want to do that for climate change. So it requires unprecedented ambition and coordination, but it is possible. And if we can achieve that green line, we could feed the world and protect biodiversity and uh, ameliorate climate change. Let's come back for a second to COVID. Um, a task force that the Jeff convened concluded, as other reports have, that unsustainable exploitation of um, the environment from land use change, from agricultural expansion, from wildlife trade and consumption, disrupts natural interactions, and it increases contact between wildlife, livestock, people, microbes, pathogens, and that that has led to almost all the pandemics. So climate change, biodiversity loss are components of these disruptions. The price tag is supposedly in the five to six trillion dollar range um, for COVID, and I'm sure every one of your mandates and missions were affected by that. I mean, virtually all human occupations were affected by COVID from uh, indigenous fisheries in Canada to tourism in Africa to farming in Brazil uh, to meat processing in the United States. And, and more than a billion and a half students were out of school and um, tens of millions of people are expected to be pushed back into extreme poverty and hunger. But let's talk about some positives. <laughs> Um, nature can actually help with climate mitigation or reducing emissions. Um, if you, one area that I think has been underattended to is the role that nature can play in taking emissions out of the atmosphere. Up to a third of what's needed in this urgent decade, and that is the green band that you see under the globe. There's a huge amount of carbon that is protected in areas now, but we can get a lot more by better management of farming and soils and restoring degraded lands too. And we're gonna need all of that. Just one example, there is a really important role of intact forests. And I wanna thank Eileen for this picture. I, intact forests appear to have broader resilience to shocks, to surprises, to fires and invasive species. So during the big Brazilian Amazon fires, the nightlight satellite on the right shows you large circles of dark where you don't see fires burning. That's not on fire. And 
there were large intact protected areas acting as buffers within those circles that you see in the right. But only 40% of our forests globally are still intact. It's very important because forests hold a third of the carbon and we can't risk losing that sink. So intact ecosystems can be more resilient to extreme events such as fires, but also as we see mangroves from sea level rise, etc. So to tie this all together, the confluence of nature loss and climate change threaten food, water, development prospects, indigenous people, um, and especially the two billion people living in countries where uh, environmental security um, and climate security and human and economic security are all interlinked and they're facing fragmentation and they're fragile and there's conflict and there's violence. So I hope I've convinced you <laughs> that environment and climate are intimately affecting your ability to achieve your missions and failure to consider them can lead to failures. I, I did enjoy um, reading some of your literature as I said at the beginning and several papers by Yuha too. <laughs> and I think we really need more interconnections between those of us who provide input to the project design and those of you who evaluate their success or failure and very importantly why these are happening. I think we need to publish in each other's worlds and participate in each other's meetings. So what I gleaned from your literature um, as possible proposals forward are these. First, include both social and nature outcomes in your evaluation. The second one is include a very strong theory of change to explain how an activity leads to the desired impact and under what conditions it will. And, and I would just add, I think a theory of change can't just be a one-off thing. It's important to keep it under review in light of changing circumstances, arrival of new actors uh, to assess the progress and to assist learning adaptively, if you will. Third, clearly your agency leadership must want it and support this approach. Um, fourth, include experts in both social and nature areas. Fifth, multi-stakeholder dialogue, um, top down, bottom up, including local knowledge, indigenous peoples, gender, youth. Sixth, evaluate the potential for co-benefits or uh, for conflicting outcomes. Uh, seventh was knowledge management. Make sure you are collecting and um, arranging the information in ways that can be accessed and available and sharing it. And then eighth, a challenge to you that I found in the literature, can UNEG developed generalized guidance on how to build environment and social together as that has been done for gender or for human rights. Many of the steps needed to um, green the economy might require upfront investments uh, to lower uh, the costs and, and might mean that you have lower returns in the short term. So I see a lot of discussion about trade-offs in your literature too, which clearly is important and you have to think through. Is it an immediate outcome you want or a longer term outcome? Because in the case of farming, if you go from intense farming, as this picture shows, uh, to something that's more sustainable, low-till or no-till agroforestry practice, there's going to be a transition costs and outcomes may not be available in a very short project period. So a lot of what you appear to recommend in your literature also appears to have come um, to the mind of, of STAP as we have been trying to design what we're calling better projects. And we came up with these puzzle pieces or design elements. Um, and I give you here the hot link to the summary paper, but actually each of these elements has their own paper, should you be a glutton for punishment. But um, the yellow puzzle piece is, is apply systems thinking and a clear theory of change, very close to what you said. Orange is apply exemplary stakeholder engagement. Uh, again, top down, bottom up, not just government officials, including youth, indigenous knowledge, and women. The pink is pursue integrated approaches to maximize the po positive synergies and to avoid doing harm. The maroon is one I didn't see. 
explicitly in your work, but it's behavioral change. And there, most Jeff projects we find expect somebody to change their behavior, but not how that's supposed to happen. And, and that change will probably lead to distributional changes in outcomes and power dynamics. So we think that needs to be thought through carefully. Uh, the blue-green is invest in innovation, where that could be m new management practices, could be new technologies, could be new finance models, new policies, new institutions. But as you're thinking about innovation, you have to realize that that may bring some risk with it. And uh, Jeff is now thinking about risk appetite, appropriate risk appetite, to spur innovation but not make projects too risky, as the council asks. Um, Olive is, uh, since we need transformational change, do these interventions have the potential to scale? Uh, red is, think about not just the lifetime of your project, but is it going to be durable? What kind of futures might there be that could change achieving what you want and making it durable? And the blue is KM, knowledge management, develop explicit plans and funding for good quality knowledge management with monitoring, evaluation, and learning along the way and sharing those best practices, which I have to say the academic world cannot find easily. Um, and so I just want to, you know, say that the behavioral change one is one that I, I would encourage you to, to think more about because I've actually described it as a Jeff Council as sort of, you know, we know what needs to change and we assume it does change and there's this miracle in the middle, the how never gets very well defined. Okay, so let's come back to where we started. Um, we know that human well-being depends equally on e ecological capital, social capital, and economic capital, but we have tended to discount two of those. And so as you and we all work to achieve the sustainable de development goals, we've got to regrow those Mickey Mouse ears together. And we can do that if the strong underpinning of the SDGs uh, on the biosphere, which I show here um, using Rockstrom's diagram as SDG 6, clean water, 13, climate, 14, uh, life below water, and 15, life on land. They're shown here as the bottom of that birthday cake uh, and are recognized as key to support the social indicators, which ultimately support the economies. And I think this is a, a way that we can move towards um, sustainable development together. I believe that when an issue hits a cartoon stage, it's a sign that public awareness is increasing. And while we have been appropriately focused on COVID and the recession, we must not ignore the tsunamis behind it of climate change and biodiversity. There is cause for optimism because the business world, the UN agencies, philanthropy, the public have growing awareness of the urgency of global environmental problems. And so we hope that governments will accelerate their interventions uh, to, to attack this quickly. So I want to end by saying we must collectively account for both environmental and social risks to consider alternative future outcomes and avert those that lead to increased suffering and injustice. There will be more pandemics, more droughts, more floods, more extreme events, sea level rise, species loss, land degradation. The time is short on social and environmental issues to be confronted, but we must do so together or we will be the first generation to leave the next a truly irreversible problem. So I leave you with this picture of a huge flock of pelicans resting in a water reservoir near the central Israeli coastal city of Netanya on their annual migration to Africa. The pelicans line up in rows and look in the same direction. They're very organized birds. I suggest we practitioners, professors, philanthropists, and evaluators all similarly work together to advance human security, equity, and a sustainable future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Rosina. Without uh, further ado, so we'll move directly to Eileen here, and, and the Pelicans will all be 
watching this way. <laughs> Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Rosina, for sharing that amazing overview. Um, I uh, want to sh shift gears a little bit and really share our perspective as a funder in this field of what we're seeing in terms of really where those benefits are of um, focusing on these interconnections. And in particular, what I think the evaluation community can contribute by way of evidence to help guide the work forward. Um, it really is a privilege to be, have a seat at the table with this group today. Um, while, as you heard, I am not an evaluation professional, I represent an institution that uh, really values the um, benefits of monitoring an evaluation. It is our North Star, and it is really what we use to keep our work grounded in strategy and always focused on impact. Um, and I'm especially glad to be part of this timely conversation as I was chatting with uh, some of my collaborators from UNEP and UNDP yesterday. They reminded me that um, just as recently as 2021, the UN Chief's Executive Board uh, endorsed the common approach to biodiversity as a commitment to integrate biodiversity and nature-based solutions for sustainable development into UN policy practices and programs. Um, and uh, as we were talking about the, uh, this meeting, uh, what really struck me was that it's one thing to sort of say that we aspire to mainstream this into our work. It's another thing to be able to identify the most in places, important places to do that. And I think it really is the evaluation community that has the knowledge and insights that can operationalize something like the common approach to biodiversity. Maybe just for those of you that don't know us a little bit about the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So we were established by Intel co-founder Gordon Moore and his wife Betty as the private vehicle for their philanthropy. Um, and the foundation really reflects their twin passions for scientific discovery and preserving the natural world. Um, in the last 20 years, we've probably delivered well over $2 billion of investment into the conservation of intact natural ecosystems as uh, reservoirs for biodiversity and life support systems for humanity. And we support um, uh, uh, iconic landscapes like the Amazon and the Arctic, and we also work on things like food value chains um, and their sustainability. And I think if you were to talk to the other NGOs and partners that we work with, they would tell you that the Moore Foundation takes monitoring, evaluation, and learning very seriously. It uh, really is a mandate that comes straight from our founder, Gordon Moore, and it's really in the DNA of everything that we do in our work with partners and in the investments that we choose to make. We take the approach of anchoring all of our major investments in theories of change that are designed to articulate and test our key assumptions about what it will take to deliver impact and bring our work to scale. And most importantly, I think we really view our theories of change as something that can help us improve our understanding of the systems that we're trying to influence over time. Because I think if there's anything that I suspect all of you know and that we've learned in our work is because it is so complex, the um, value that we get from evaluation is as much about knowing what has worked and hasn't as about finding those frontiers of how the system responds and being able to adapt our work accordingly. Um, we uh, are very focused in our work. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for a very large foundation actually takes on only a small number of long-term efforts. And as such, I think we are always trying to balance this creative tension between maintaining a laser-like focus on the smart outcomes that we've set out on a long-term, but at the same time, maintaining an openness to being able to shift our definition of both the problem 
problem and the solution space based on the evidence that we're getting back from our um, impact evaluations. So we really, I think, have tried hard to manage that evidence, that tension through evidence-based adaptive management, I, I, um, something I think this community knows well. And increasingly, um, we are also really asking ourselves if we can conduct our monitoring, evaluation, and learning in ways that captures evidence that can contribute back to the field, right? What we're finding is that for so many of our partners, um, they may like to innovate and find new ways of doing things, but there isn't always that understanding of the contextualization in terms of under what circumstances something works and is effective, and in what cases it's not. Um, and that if we're all striving for speed and scale and execution, the evidence that we can bring to that makes, makes such a tremendous difference. But I think maybe the most important thing I want to um, emphasize in introducing myself and the Moore Foundation is, you know, we uh, really are an organization that's tightly focused on the environment, just as many of you represent agencies with missions that are tightly and narrowly focused on a specific slice of the sustainable development goal, right? Whether it's women, food, children, my, um, refugees and migrants and so on. And I um, am not here today because I'm advocating that somehow the environmental goals that our foundation pursues are any more important than the goals that the different agencies you work with represent. Uh, rather, I'm here because I think the interconnections between our goals really matter. We may work on different pieces of the sustainable development agenda, but if we want to accomplish change at the s speed and pace and, and scope that's necessary, it really is about how we operate collectively towards systems change. Um, and I think the nature of Earth systems is really that they underpin sustainable development in a way that when we look for those key linkages that the Earth systems point us to, it really illuminates those places where our agendas come together. And, uh, and I would say this is as much about understanding how environment fits into other agendas as it is about understanding, for me, how the things that many of you work on can make the work in the environment more successful, right? So it really is about a dialogue, I think, between these goals. Um, so, so I really think, you know, if, um, if, if, if I were to really take, have you take away one message today, it's, you know, that this is not about a zero sum game, right, where we're advocating shifting attention from the towards the environment away from other elements of the sustainable development agenda. It really is about enhancing our capacity to think about this in an integrated way. I, th I think that really makes a huge difference. Um, so uh, to maybe go a little deeper, I'd like to cover three more three more points. Um, first, maybe to build on Rosina's talk a bit. To, um, I think one of the things that is exciting is we're now at a point where our understanding of these um, integrated agenda and these interlinks really allows us to focus our work and to look for those evidence points and those data points that we know whether we're on trajectory or not, right? So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I'd like to share some lessons from the Moore Foundation, frankly, about how finding these unexpected interconnections right between these elements of the work really transformed the work that we were doing and, and uh, made it much more effective than when we were focused um, in some ways narrowly on our piece without, without seeing that bigger picture. Um, and then I'll also share some um, reflections really from, from our own evaluation team in terms of how we work practically to try to bring these interdependencies into our work. So Rosina talked a bit about the World Economic Forum and their risk assessment, and, and I had the opportunity to be a participant in those dialogues last week. And um, what struck me was that there was really one number that was on the lips of all of the uh, leaders and CEOs who saw these presentations about the risks and, and heard about the shared challenges before us. And what a number of them repeated in session after session was three billion. Three billion is the number of people that the Earth Commission's latest findings on planetary boundaries say will live in parts of the world that will be 
uninhabitable by 2070 if we stay on the same course that we're on in terms of being outside of planetary boundaries for key Earth systems. Three billion. It's, you know, I think it drives home that this is not just a planetary crisis, but fundamentally a humanitarian crisis. And it really is probably three billion of the people who are most vulnerable um, already if we, if we uh, think about rolling that tape forward. Um, some of the work that was previewed, and I, I think it's uh, it will be published quite soon, was um, work that actually the GEF, the Moore Foundation, and many other donors have sponsored through the Global Commons Alliance Earth Commission. Um, the lead authors, Johan Rockström and Joyita Gupta, um, really pointed us towards some very um, specific knowledge of the Earth systems that we need to keep in bounds in order to keep a safe and just operating space for humanity. We've all heard a lot about the climate boundary, right, of 1.5 degrees, that this really is a physical limit. But I think what was exciting about the work is it pointed towards other targets, right, that as those who deal with finding and focusing on the evidence, we can, we can monitor in our work in order to understand how they connect to these important planetary goals. Um, those are around the biosphere, around freshwater, fertilizer systems, aerosol, and aerosols. And just to give you an example, with the biosphere, right, what this data found is that it's really about 50 to 60 percent of intact nature that's got to be kept in place to support the world economy. And for already developed land, so land that's being used for agriculture or other uses, about 25 percent of every square kilometer needs to be kept with flora and fauna at natural levels, right? And that if we can do that, we can maintain systems. Similarly with water, they found that 20% of natural flows and extraction must be less than recharge around the world. And there were similar um, targets around fertilizer systems, aerosols, all creating boundaries that I think are actionable, right? In terms of how we can assess our impacts. And I, I think the other part that was really exciting as, as we're making progress on looking at these interlinkages is it not only helps us better understand the scope of the problem and these boundaries, but it's also pointing us towards where the breakthrough solutions are, right? And and what we what um, I think the work of the um, Global Commons Alliance Systems Change Lab has shown is that the most powerful breakthroughs tend to be the ones that really connect again across these silos, right? So what um, this work and research has done is to look for the so-called positive tipping points, right? So Rosina showed you the kind of scary ecological tipping points, but the positive uh, tipping points are the ones where the combinations of policy change, behavior change, right, economic change can lead to those positive cascades and real benefits. And one of the ones that um, came out as a, as a top challenge was, was, was the notion of basically uh, driving procurement towards um, alternative plant-based proteins, right? And where this really comes out is if you think about it, it unites so many of the agendas in this room, right? It's about diet and health. It's about being able to sustain um, farming and ag at a level to feed a much larger population. It certainly um, has huge impacts on climate and land use. And again, just it, I think it's those interconnections that when we really focus in, start focusing on the places where we can, we can generate real solutions. Um, I, I guess the other thing I would share um, is w when when I think about the discussions that folks were having about these findings at the forum, um, it, it is as much about um, sh shifting this or raising this awareness of the environmental issues as it is about making the environmental work more effective. So I sat in on several sessions where focusing on these points, um, we talked about um, the interconnections between climate and health, for example, right, um, and how really being able to work effectively in climate means knowing how to center health when that's appropriate, and similarly with work on women and, uh, and work on food systems. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to work in this much more interconnected way.
I, I, I think the other reason that I personally feel so strongly about these things is when I look at the history of the work that we've done at the Moore Foundation, um, I can point to a lot of examples where our work was not on track until we started thinking in these broader ways, right? So um, the Moore Foundation marine conservation has always been a real point of emphasis for us. Um, and uh, if you look at fisheries management, for those of you that know fisheries management, the um, if you roll the tape back probably 25, 30 years, right, the traditional approach to fisheries management focused very tightly just on the ecological imperative, right? So we basically said, okay, we know what's needed for um, sustainable populations. We're going to set that target and we're just going to try to enforce that target as hard as we can against fishermen. Um, what that really led to perversely was a race for fish, right? So what you try to do is you close and open the windows of the fishery, the fishermen, when it's open, just fish as hard as they can. Uh, it turned out not to be a very good thing for uh, the environment, for the fishermen, um, for anybody. Um, then at that point, one of our partners, the Environmental Defense Fund, really flipped the question a bit by saying, well, what could this look like if we really think about the economics of fishery production, right? So basically, what is it that um, fishermen need? How is it that they can really produce commercially valuable catch? And the result of that was an innovation um, that's basically known as catch shares, rights-based catch shares for fishermen, right? Where instead of managing them to these tight regulated openings and closings, they receive a long-term share to, um, of fish um, which they can choose to uh, fish and catch on, on a schedule of their own making. Um, and what we found in assessing the impact of it was the um, the outcome was actually uh, quite impressive in terms of what that led to for the fishery performance on a number of dimensions. From just the standpoint of those ecological targets we were looking at, compliance changed dramatically with average landings now 5% below right what was the cap that we were previously trying to maintain and always overshooting. Um, it, we also saw that it was really improving just our knowledge of the fishery, right? And that in uh, that suddenly about 75% of the fisheries were actually able to invest in the monitoring that was necessary to be able to have visibility into the stocks, whereas previously only about a quarter of fisheries, you could even have that knowledge, right, of what was performing. And that was all because the economics of the fishery had changed in a way that it was in the interest of the fishery to be able to invest back in these monitoring systems. Um, we saw bycatch go down by 40%, right? Again, because it allowed them to change their gear types, be much more focused and, uh, and, and efficient in how they were pra uh, practicing. Um, and, uh, but I think importantly, we also saw that it um, had other impacts that were quite valuable as well. In terms of safety, um, it basically um, uh, reduced by half the number of vessels that were lost, the number of lives that were lost, the number of search and rescue um, operations and safety violations that were being logged in these fleets. Um, and in terms of the economics, we saw that revenues per boat were up about 80%. Um, but that's not the end of the story. I will say the other thing that we learned in doing our evaluations is that um, we had not paid enough attention to the, uh, the justice in the distribution of these benefits, right? So that in the original structure, while 80% of the, while you saw this 80% increase in revenues, it was very concentrated because the nature of the catch shares basically also meant that fishermen who own these shares often changed the way that they were staffing their boats, right? So, sort of leaving it just to their family members, cutting out some of the labor and other staff. Um, and frankly, what we started to realize when we did our assessments was this was a long-term durability risk, right, with this system, because even though it was in many ways very um, successful, uh, there were a number of people who were now on the outside looking in, right? So that's led to further innovations in how we design these things. Um, so that's, I, you know, I, 
I think for me, just uh, a, a really important example in our work about how not only was it important to look outside our immediate issue for these connections to find the better solution, but to keep learning, right? As, as I think all of you in this room really promote, because what we have found is um, it, it continues to push us towards better and better solutions as we go. Um, another example I would highlight in this vein that I think, frankly, is probably one of the most important improvements in the way that um, those of us who focus on environmental conservation do our work is really around the role of indigenous peoples and local communities in conservation work. And um, I think a recognition that um, empowering their rights and tenure, or their systems of management um, can really be transformative, right? So I would say when when we started our conservation work at the foundation over 20 years ago, we were focused, um, we worked quite a bit with indigenous peoples in the Amazon and also the First Nations in British Columbia. Um, and to be honest, we really did not understand right, the, the uh, advantages that could come from partnering with those communities at the time. Right? In fact, if I look back at the models we had at the time between us, right, there was a discount factor right, on indigenous lands relative to strict protected areas because at the time the perception was, well, it's those strict protected areas right, that really get you the benefits that you seek. Um, you know, roll forward. And what we see today is a very different evidence base that's been built up over these years, right, about the connections between IPLC management and um, impact on the ground. Um, importantly, uh, what we saw, for example, a uh, landmark World Resources Institute survey that um, looked in, in our backyard for us in the Amazon found that um, forests under indigenous control are a net carbon sink, right? Sequestering about 340 million um, tons of CO2 per year. Whereas forests that are not in indigenous control on are a net carbon source. That was an eye opener for us, right? Just recognizing the biggest difference that you were seeing in the effects of stewardship. Um, similarly, you know, uh, we work in Brazil uh, and, and Canada, as I said, and a, a study there um, a few years ago illuminated that if you look at vertebrate biodiversity, um, indigenous managed lands are at a minimum equivalent to protected areas, right, in terms of what you're trying to preserve with biodiversity. And in fact, when it came to threatened species, the um, impact was much better, right, if you looked at these uh, protected lands. And finally, um, I think the data in the last few years has gotten even stronger about property rights in deforestation, right? What we're really seeing is evidence that where you have stable regimes of tenure and property rights, deforestation goes down. Um, so all of that, you know, really, I think, has led us to rethink our approaches, to push our partners, um, the NGOs that we work with, to rethink their approaches. And, and I think conservation is strong stronger for it. And I think hopefully the rights agenda, the human rights agenda has benefited as well. Um, finally, just maybe a, another story. I think, um, you know, we uh, focus a lot on deforestation um, and our um, instinct had really been to emphasize the climate aspects of that, right? Because everybody understands the um, aspect of stored carbon, um, how that affects global climate and, you know, really makes that a strong argument for deforestation. But as we were delving into the evidence and the projects we were supporting on the ground, we realized that one of the things that we had really missed that um, Holly Gibbs, a researcher we supported um, in, in, in evaluating the projects found out, is that um, in fact, what really matters with deforestation is the connection to crop yield at very local levels, right? Because of these heat effects. So if you're, if you're really thinking in terms of, okay, yield and production as a farmer, right? As opposed to just the environmental impacts of deforestation, what we really found was there was a tremendous link between deforestation and just locally what was happening as far as crop production 
productivity um, and, uh, and, and, and profitability. Um, and that completely changed the way that we were able to engage um, the agricultural sector in our work. Um, so anyway, just a sampling, but I, I, you know, I could probably go on and on, but as I said, this is really, for me, why I think the Moore Foundation feels so strongly about having um, evaluation at the heart of everything we do, because I would say, honestly, we probably could have put um, you know, millions and millions and millions into things that would have actually pushed things in the wrong direction, right, if we um, hadn't been paying attention to the evidence that we were getting back. Um, so maybe just to, to wrap up, uh, I just wanted to offer at least some reflections as a, as a non-evaluator on um, how it is we can approach all of this in a more interlinked way, recognizing that there is that tension, right, between you can't monitor and track everything, and yet we do want to be able to bring this bigger picture into play. Um, for me, this is really about just expanding that aperture a bit while maintaining a focus, right? So what we always ask our partners and our teams is when we look at our theory of change, right, what are the assumptions when we think about this bigger systems picture that are most worth monitoring and learning about? And what we try to emphasize is this doesn't have to be a burdensome thing, right, where we suddenly start trying to track every metric on every dimension. What we really try to focus on is we basically say, well, let's just focus on the one or two maybe questions that we have at the edge of our theory of change, where if we could learn a bit from every single one of the projects that we're working on, right, where we might be able to really make a contribution. And when I think about some of the work that you all are doing in this room, right, uh, what strikes me is how valuable that would be, right, to others who are doing this, right? So uh, increasing, I think that Rosina mentioned the Das Gupta report, which I think for the first time really um, elevated the role of women, right, I think, um, in, in environmental work. And I think if I think about the many different projects that the UN agencies support with that lens, the ability to have better data, right, on these connections between the role of women and environmental stewardship and outcomes, those are the kinds of things that really drive those big shifts that help refocus the work in ways that are um, tremendously powerful. Um, and then finally, I, I think what's so exciting, at least in seeing the diversity of data that this room brings together, is I think it's really an opportunity to help the field learn about the interconnections, right? Because I think, um, unfortunately, what we have found is, you know, th there's a reason that data on this stuff is so hard to get. Right, because nobody um, has that incentive, and frankly, most aren't set up to make those interconnections. Right, but what feels very powerful about the group assembled around this table is, in some ways, the UN Evaluators Group is a natural place, right, to have those communities where you can make those connections across the evidence sets you're seeing. Um, so for me, it's very exciting, and I'm glad to have had the opportunity to chat with you a bit today. Thank you very much, Eileen and uh, Rosina as well. So uh, you've you made the point very eloquently, uh, and um, and the issue of interconnections and in integration is very very um, clear. Um, so after after all of this, I shouldn't I shouldn't really be saying anything, um, um, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, um, I'm just trying to tie it uh, a little bit more to what we are also doing. You have both talked about evaluation and the importance of evaluation and learning, but uh, a little bit more on the same. But um, we've heard uh, from these um, speakers how, uh, this morning how human development really depends on the natural uh, environment and, and how ignoring it um, uh, will have consequences. And, and the interesting thing is really that um, it's not the environmentalists who are speaking. Uh, it's it's the Davos crowd, <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, the, not the, exactly the usual suspects in in this re uh, regard. And 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 it's interesting. Also, uh, we are all getting uh, richer, uh, but um, 
but uh, I was at the seminar quite recently, a couple of weeks ago, with Pedro Conceição, whom some of you know, who is the head of the uh, Human Development Report Office in, the, in UNDP. And UNDP has been doing this for more than 30 years, this Human Development Reports. And he said uh, that this year, for the first time, the Human Development Indi Index has actually gone down. And 74% of people in G20 countries are saying that, uh, that they would like us to change the system from focusing on, on measuring economic growth to measuring well-being. So well-being economics is uh, very important here. And as uh, we have heard, so uh, economy is uh, deeply embedded in, in nature. Uh, we know the, uh, tw the whole 2030 agenda and, and the SDGs rest on these three dimensions. And I have the same uh, wedding cake here that uh, Rosina uh, showed earlier. And, and the point with that is really that, um, uh, that it's the environmental foundation. It's, it's the, bio, uh, the biosphere that is the foundation for sustainable development. And if this is destabilized or de destroyed, we can forget about the niceties of, uh, of uh, economic and social um, um, development. And it's also safe to say uh, that basically everything uh, that we humans do will have some environmental consequences. And these can be, of course, both um, positive, but often they are negative. And very often they are unanticipated and unintended. So as evaluators, we really have to um, uh, pay attention to them. So I will argue that all evaluations, irrespective of the field, should pay attention to the environmental impact. And at the very least, uh, we evaluators should uh, think through what the possible uh, environmental impacts would be. And it's the, the onus to me is on, on the evaluators to say that, OK, in this, in this evaluation, for this reason and for that reason, we do not have to pay attention to the environment. But if, the, if we evaluate this, if we miss the environmental impact, we will uh, run into faulty con conclusions and, and give a wrong view of the success of the intervention. In many cases, this assessment will only be too optimistic uh, and actually then encourage policies and programs that are detrimental to sustainable development. So as we've heard, so uh, there is today a very wide recognition of the, of the centrality of environmental sustainability, the uh, future of humankind. And I'm being a little bit uh, uh, provocative here, because I, I claim that there is actually evidence that uh, evaluation as a profession is lagging behind this global trend. As you know, I've been uh, co-coordinating the UNEG Working Group on Environmental Impact uh, for the past uh, three and a half years. We've done a bunch of assessments, uh, both at the evaluation systems and, and evaluation reports, and, and, and we've uh, gathered information from all of you. And we've documented that very few evaluations in the UN system look at environmental impacts uh, in any systematic manner. 45% of you, of you uh, said that uh, your work is somehow concerned with the environment. I'm, I'm actually not sure whether this is a glass half full or half empty, because it's, it's really good that um, 45% of, of you think that it's uh, important, but on the other hand, it means that 55% uh, uh, think that uh, what you do has nothing to do with the environment, and that's not really good. But 84% of you uh, thought that the environment, uh, that environment is not adequately covered in, 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 in evaluations. Likewise, the, U, uh, the Canadian Evaluation Society has recently conducted an assessment which found that evaluations that consider sustainability and the natural system more generally are infrequent and capacity is limited. The assessment covered a wide range of Canadian agencies, but they looked also at, uh, at uh, uh, the topics that um, uh, Canadian Evaluation Society and American Evaluation Association um, is covering in, in, their part, uh, in, in their 
publications and in, in, in their um, conferences. And, and it's actually very little when it comes to uh, anything looking into uh, the natural system side of the coupled human and natural systems. And this is not a uh, challenge that is uh, that is not uh, has a, hasn't gone unnoticed. So, for example, the Global Evaluation Initiative, um, which you are uh, aware of, has has this uh, footprint evaluation, uh, which aims to embed environmental uh, considerations in all evaluations, irrespective of the evaluant. So, uh, what we would adv advocate for, and and this is. Um, the GEF speaking, GEFIEO maybe, <laughs> uh, uh, that is, is that we have to take a uh, systems approach to evaluation. Um, we also, uh, we come from the environmental side of things, so, so in the past uh, we largely ignored the humans. And, and, and it, um, you know, Eileen's example of the fisheries was a very, very good one because uh, that's how the GEF saw the world also. We would, and the, and the protected areas, we, we would, um, uh, the strategy was to, you know, to put it bluntly, to give um, jeeps and AK-47s to, uh, to um, wardens who would keep people out of, out of protected areas. But that has changed because it didn't work. So um, we, the GEF as a learning organization has realized that we, we do need to pay attention uh, to the hum humans here also. So in our evaluations also we pay a lot of en uh, emphasis on to, to um, the link, links uh, between environmental, different environmental domains, biodiversity and land degradation and climate and so on that um, were mentioned earlier, but also uh, to um, the socioeconomic and health factors, uh, the, uh, what happens to people. The point being uh, that um, all interventions also uh, take place in a, in, 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 in a larger system where they interact with uh, the policy frameworks, the market conditions, the other ac actors, and 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 interventions. So it's it's not really meaningful for us anymore to evaluate an inter intervention just simply through its own internal logic. Of course, like Eileen was saying, you can't cover everything in 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 evaluations, but it is important to analyze the system in which uh, the um, uh, the intervention is operating, and, and, and then define what is relevant and, and, and basically draw the boundaries of the system that you want to look in the, in the, in the evaluation. And like I said, per, perhaps already, uh, is that um, it's very important for, for the um, evaluations always to, look, to be on the lookout for unintended consequences, and also because this is another uh, point to emphasize this, uh, not looking only at the internal logic, is that because they often are unanticipated, so by definition they are not uh, included in the, in the theory of change of the, of, the, of the evaluant. As a side note, by the way, the UNEG assessment did suggest that very many of the un unanticipated, unanticipated consequences identified in evaluations could well have been anticipated mm -hmm. had the intervention proponents and the evaluators had a better understanding of the environmental side of things up front. So many types of interventions are, of course, um, uh, distinctly place-bound, but um, scale also matters, and sustainability is often vertically uh, integrated across uh, geographical scales. What happens at the local level is often linked to global economic con uh, processes, as in the case of commodity supply chains change that uh, have been mentioned earlier today. Um, while the production of many commodities takes place mostly in the south, uh, it is driven primarily by consumption in the north and, and increasingly in China. So, for example, here's a, here's a little uh, tidbit, uh, which is that we have three ubiquitous um, daily commodities that we all use that are um, basically responsible for about 80% of tropical deforestation. And these are obviously 
guessed it, it's uh, beef, beef cattle, basically. But it's also palm oil, which is basically everywhere uh, that we use daily without knowing it. And it's our uh, dear soybeans, which are, of course, also used to feed uh, cattle quite, quite a lot. The same goes uh, for, for example, illegal wildlife tra trade. You can't address it successfully just by focusing on poaching, but you'll have to deal with the demand for wildlife products and all the actors in between the source countries and where the ultimate buyers are. So programs dealing with these kind of in environmental uh, consequences and their evaluation must consider the entire chain and where, where uh, these uh, problems occur. If interventions are to achieve transformational change that is durable, they must be positioned at the correct level. It is not sufficient to address only the, viable, uh, the, the visible sim symptoms, but evaluation for its part must uh, ascertain whether interventions have correctly identified the drivers, devised appropriate strategies for dealing with them, and whether they are effectively implemented for good results. Of course, our goal is to seek win-win uh, uh, situations for people and the planet. Unfortunately, as we know, this is not always possible. As evaluators, we have to look for situations where there are synergies to achieve multiple benefits and where there are trade-offs that need to be managed, bearing in mind that both, uh, both uh, synergies and trade-offs can exist simultaneously in the same intervention. So evaluation must uh, help to understand uh, these situations and explain the conditions where synergies can be achieved or where trade-offs must be managed. Again, it is important to look at both the human and the natural uh, systems in an integrated manner. So just uh, maybe obvious, but the trade-offs uh, may take very uh, many shapes and forms that, uh, that we have, um, have to be aware of. Our evaluations at the GEF have shown that they often appear between environmental sustainability and socio-economic goals. Uh, that is between the people's livelihoods and the need to protect the resource base. But on the other hand, not all environmental goals uh, operate in full synergy either. So for example, uh, not to make a too fine point of it, but uh, um, reforestation, for example, may be good for carbon sequestration or, uh, or uh, land and water management, but, but it may, may even be detrimental to biodiversity conservation. So very often there is a conflict between the short and the long term. For example, uh, we looked in, in GEF um, uh, project in, in Brazil that had to deal with pressures from short-term extraction of timber and uns unsustainable uh, farming practices that threatened biodiversity and the long-term sus sustainability of the same agricultural production uh, system. Here, the solution was to set out parts of land under protection, but we had to deal also then with the, with the people who, did, uh, who depended on it and to compensate for the immediate loss of income. The government set up a, a tax benefit scheme to affected farmers. Or in another case, in, in, in the drylands of Western China, poverty was forcing communities to utilize their land resources in an unsustainable manner. So it was very important to identify actions that would reduce households' need uh, to rely on these short-term solutions. So what are the implications for evaluation? I think that the first uh, obvious thing is that these traditional logic models, the theory of, theories of change that we are using, they are linear and, and they often miss big pieces. We therefore need an open theory of change that can account for what happens around the evaluant and how the intervention inter interacts with other parts of the system in that space where it operates. It is also important to remember that some parts uh, may be directly working against the, uh, the goals of, of our intervention. So not everything is, we are working against uh, the tide, so to say, and, and one, one uh, drastic example is obviously so. Uh, we know that um, that, the, pub, uh, that uh, the total funding for climate action from both public and private sources is, a, it's, is about 
$650 billion a year, which sounds a lot. But the IMF came up um, with a report a year ago uh, which estimates that the governments, the same governments, uh, pay about $5.9 trillion, an order of magnitude more, alone in fossil fuel su subsidies. So we often end up um, um, fighting against these kind of issues. So the evaluators can't focus only on the immediate actions and outputs of the intervention, but to, we have to ascertain whether it is making a dent in the problem that's the, that's, uh, that it's set out to rectify. That means whether it is addressing the root causes of that problem or just tinkering at the margins. Similarly, it's very important for us to pay close attention to unintended consequences. I'm saying it probably for the third time. But it's uh, not only for the environment, but also the other, other aspects, say, for vulnerable groups, for women, the indigenous peoples, uh, power relations, and so on. All this calls for a systems perspective to evaluation in which the intervention is placed in the broader human and natural uh, context. Okay, so now I uh, hear some of you thinking here that, okay, so that this is a nice theory, but uh, it's yet another add-on, uh, yet another thing that the evaluators have to, are now supposed to uh, cover in addition to, uh, you name it, all the social aspects and so on. Uh, it's a yet another thing to tick off. So where does this all end? But it's also, like Eileen was saying, that this is uh, uh, not um, um, zero-sum game here. They are all bits and pieces of the same puzzle of, the, of what we have called for sustainable development for a while now. Um, so this is not an add-on, uh, but I, I'd like to think that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the missing piece that has been missing from evaluation uh, here. So if evaluation is to contribute to sustainability, uh, sustainability transitions, what you want to call it, we must raise our game and, and to truly evaluate at the nexus where social and economic uh, development interacts with the natural environment. And we must um, uh, convince the users of our, of our evaluations that this is also in their interest to ascertain that their actions lead to durable change that benefits people in an equitable manner in the long term. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. I think we have a little bit of time to open it up for uh, this. Adan. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much to the presenters for their excellent, informative, <coughs> enlightening, scary, and hopeful, it, everything in, <laughs> in a nutshell, no? the, of, of all your presentations. I wanted to, I, it resonated with me all of the, or, or at least as an evaluator and uh, resonated with many of the things that, that you've said, uh, interconnectedness, integration. And I wanted to, to put something on the table as well in terms of considering our evaluations, uh, interventions within interventions. So our evaluations are actually potential transformative uh, arrow or or let's say of, uh, yeah, a tra potential tra transformational um, intervention within the projects that we are evaluating. So that, that's one thing. I'd like also to, to, to draw from your thought about institutions. And uh, I think, uh, Rosina, you, you had in one of your slides the, the, the word institutions, a crisis institution or institutional crisis. We are also in that, in the business of improving institutions, and, and I think that's uh, an essential part of, of what we can do with our recommendations and, and with our evaluations. And also addressing the behavioral change. You also, I think both the three of you mentioned that the behavioral change is, is that this that black box that our theories of change sometimes don't, don't, don't capture well, or even sometimes we, you know, we don't consider our biases as, uh, as humans and decision making, this is a whole science of decision making that it's uh, very important in, in, the, in the way our evaluations are going to be used. So that's the, that's the second thing I'd like to use. And then, uh, sorry to say, and then the third thing I, I think we can do as evaluators is to promote 
to be yeah to be the champ champions or one of the champions of a culture of uh, experimentation um that's something that um you know an empirical culture of then organizations continue learning continue measuring things thoroughly and uh, and they make decisions based on on evidence on the best evidence that we can provide being a source for research or evaluation or whatever so that's what i wanted to to contribute with it thanks very much any thanks very much super super interesting presentations um i think from unhcr's perspective we're giving a lot more thought to to the the assumptions we make around environmental sustainability of of uh, countries hosting increasing numbers of of displaced people. I recently did a trip to Mauritania, and you know you think about the current refugee camp of Embera is the fifth largest settlement in Mauritania. The impact of that on on the on the natural environment is is huge. And then the assumptions you make if things go bottom up in Mali and still more refugees come. Uh, from Mali into Mauritania, you know, what are the assumptions we're making about the environment's uh, ability to absorb yet more pastoralists and people moving into the area? So I do think it's a question of, of assumptions, but I also think that none of us can afford to not put uh, environmental outcomes in the design of our, our uh, evaluations. So not just as something we consider as a as an assumption as we go into an evaluation, but what will the outcomes be? And there I think the importance of, of evaluation of, uh, as an opportunity for creating moments of reflection in fast-moving humanitarian operations is, is really critical um, to look at whether we're doing the right things. And, and I just want to thank uh, the Jeff and, and you, Yuha, because we're doing two evaluations in back-to-back in -back countries in Mali and Mauritania, and we want to look at the environmental issues around the programming, around the context, um, to help the country operation and think about, the two country operations think about the next five years. But we didn't have one big constraint, which was mentioned here, is, is expertise. In UNHCR, we have no expertise, n neither in our operations nor in our evaluation rosters of consultants of people who have uh, environmental backgrounds and natural resource management backgrounds. So we reached out to the Jeff and asked them for a, you know, a short list of really top experts that we might be able to draw on. So I want to thank you for that. That, that was super helpful. And um, I guess I just think that there's, there's a lot more opportunity to build synergies in the work that we do around this room. Uh, as we look at some of the major environmental challenges uh, coming up in the future. So thanks very much. Well, first of all, thanks a lot, uh, Oscar, you and uh, Yuva and the uh, UNEC leadership for uh, making space uh, for this very important session at the AGM. I think it was really overdue to have this discussion. And mainly because I fully agree with you, you, I think, I think that we as a UN evaluation community, you are nice, you said we are lagging behind. I, I think that we, we are almost failing on, on this particular aspect. And you know, the fact that 54% of ourselves says that environment is not relevant to our mandates is just an indication of that. So I think it's, it's really very important, this discussion. And if we want to see on the good aspect, on the positive aspects, I mean, uh, Luckily so, now we, we as UNEC, we have uh, guidelines on how to integrate environmental standards in, in our evaluations. I mean, that's needed, is, but it's not sufficient. I think we should ask ourselves, uh, now that we have this guidance, how to equip ourselves to make sure that we implement those guidance. And perhaps we should ask ourselves two things. First of all, what are the incentives for uh, each of us to, to integrate uh, environmental standards in our own uh, evaluations. And probably we need some normative frameworks for that. Perhaps after 80 years is already time to look back to our UNEC norm and standards, and because as of now they are more or less silent on, on environment. And probably we should include environment in our UNEC norm and standards, because if they are in our UNEC norm and standards, then when a peer review comes, this peer review will look at each of our agency, uh, the extent to which we have integrated uh, uh, these environmental uh, st uh, standards. Uh, second aspect of incentive, should we learn from uh, what we as UNEC did in integrating gender in evaluation, because we have the guidance, guidelines, but then we have an accountability mechanism in place, the UN swap. Without an accountability mechanism in place, probably this guidance, you know, 
will will uh, remain a little bit as a as a, as a piece of paper. So I think we really have we really have to think hard on how to make sure that uh, these standards will be uh, integrated. But then the second big question is, what are the implications? Because you spoke about methodologies, etc. But there are important implications in terms of capacities, in terms of cost, et cetera, et cetera. So we definitely need uh, this conversation to go on. Thanks. Thank you for the great presentations. I would have a question for Rosina. In terms of the interconnections, and in particular um, on the connections between the environmental challenges and what you think could be the next <laughs> epidemic. And I understand all the elements, like the our people movement, migrations, and all of those linkages. But your slide seemed to be where you presented COVID, herpes, HIV, seemed to um, point to more like biological reasons. So I wanted to know from you what the main uh, argument for the linkage are at this time. Thanks a lot. Juha, thank you. Thanks for organizing this and uh, very much appreciated the, the presentations that came up. Um, at UNDP, we're about to do an evaluation in Congo Brazzaville, and that reminded me of the Payment for Ecosystem Services. <coughs> which would be interesting, excuse me, would be interesting for um, perhaps one or, or both of you to comment on. We, we saw difficulties in Ecuador, we've seen difficulties in Congo in terms of uh, a, a very uh, a strong expectation from the government in terms of what payment for ecosystem services could provide. And when they didn't get what they wanted, we see gas and oil uh, drilling uh, expanding. So just, uh, uh, you know, based on your background and experience on this, it would be very interesting to, to get up a little bit of take of that because we can then take these kinds of things into account in our evaluations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, these were excellent, excellent pr presentations, the three of them. And um, I want to also touch on what other others said uh, of our profession lagging behind, and, and I, I agree on that. Um, it's, it's interesting to hear that very few of our evaluations uh, touch on environmental issues. But I do suspect that sometimes, and it's what Laurie said, is that we don't have either the, the skills or the knowledge to properly integrate these things. Um, at least I speak for myself. I mean, the motivation is there, in fact, in our uh, new UNESCO evaluation policy. We mentioned that we want to integrate another norm, which is the environmental norm, which is not present in the, in the UNIC norms and standards. Um, but we do fall short on how to do this uh, to do this well, actually. And I was interested to hear, Laurie, that you basically reached out to, to Juha to, to try to get a better, you know, to get support on this, because I do feel a, a bit kind of lost. So the motivation, the incentive for me is to do it better. But I feel that I don't know how to really uh, integrate it better in our, at least in our UNESCO evaluation. So this is very, very useful to also hear what others are, are, are doing to kind of close those gaps. Thanks. Thanks. Andreas. Yeah, thank you. Let me also uh, uh, let me also extend my thanks to you, uh, you uh, and uh, uh, Rosina, as well as Eileen, for the, for the excellent presentations. Um, from my front, I, I was just thinking, as we were reflecting on uh, environment and obviously climate, both of, of those are very relevant to topics for the Korean Climate Fund and for our evaluations. One thing that we're facing with these questions is the complexities. And you, are, you were mentioning this, this question of linear uh, theory, f theory of changes and <coughs> the limitations with that. And I think we should all be um, thinking very hard on what we would need in order to include such, uh, such standards, such an environment and nature into, into all of our, ev our evaluations, because we found that to be particularly difficult in climate evaluations to, to, to account for the complexities. Uh, and, uh, and unpack some of these some of these considerations. The second thought that I wanted to briefly mention as well was this question, um, and it relates to some of these questions that are, that uh, Rosina was also raising with the question of how can we bring people closer, evaluators as well as project designers. Uh, and we've been we've been thinking about this a lot. But one trade off that we are facing at the GCF evaluation office is. Uh, evasion unit apologies is uh, that trade-off between uh, our standards the standards of uh, accountability and independence versus the stand of, uh, standard of standard of learning and it's it's more often a question of the audience uh, that wants to look at the usefulness of our evaluation results 
that brings us then into into this question okay there's not only a trade-off in terms of short term and long term and, and and all other questions but also the question of what what sort of standards do we do we uh, uh, look at and how do we prioritize uh, across those things thanks very much i'll still ask uh, katarina here to speak uh, Otherwise, Oscar and Bo will will disown me. <laughs> they have been. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Oscar, Versina, um, Juha, and um, and Eileen. It was highly interesting, extremely um, inspiring, and and um, I wish we could really build a skill set around what you have been saying for evaluators, kind of a toolbox or something like that. For us, sometimes simple questions um, become a hurdle, like identifying an environmental experts in the area of evaluation. So um, since we are not um, environmental specialists ourselves, um, we really need these, um, these inroads you know, to really equip um, ourselves, our teams, etc. My um, um, question would be, how do you how do you foresee that this topic enters the higher level intergovernmental processes? Um, just an example, you know, we have, for example, a crime congress, or we have the COP, etc. So, how to build accountability and learning into these processes to support accountability in these interactions between member states? And I say this because, of course, the SDGs um, have provided already this space. You know, it could be improved, of course, as well. You know, the, the, the reviews are still voluntary. You know, how to really um, support this push for, you know, holding ourselves and holding member states accountable. And, you know, what role can evaluation play in this particular field of the environment? Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Oh, Mike, Mike. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm a weak chair. I'll just be very, very quick. I just wanted to add my voice to support what Marco said about maybe it's time to revisit the norms and standards. And just, just to note that the General Assembly did recently approve you know, a human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So you kind of have, have the environment up there front and center approved by a General Assembly resolution. Maybe those things cascade down normally and we capture them in, in the norms and standards, so maybe it's time to revisit that. So just to second what Marco said, thanks. Thanks, thanks. So we are really running out of time, so maybe I'll let uh, you, you uh, to uh, react a little bit to some of and if there are specific questions that you would like to You just ask. want Oscar to yell at us. <laughs> yeah. um, just a, a few quick points on uh, rosters of experts. Most UN agencies that we work with have expert lists, and I think we could help through the National Academies of Science around the world to help get more of those. Um, on the questions of how big the boundaries, how integrated, I think a lot of that needs to be worked out very early in the theory of change part, where you have to figure out the one or two questions Eileen was saying that are most important. Um, you know, what stakeholders have to be involved, what change do you want? So I think a lot of the confusion needs to be thought about early on and what can go wrong that help you define what barriers you're going to need to watch for. On synergies across geographies and across agencies, if only we could find your evaluations and intercompare them more easily, I don't know, maybe you among yourselves can, but the knowledge management systems do not interoperate between the agencies, even within the GEF. And I think figuring out how in this new IT age that we can learn from each other, from projects within programs, from programs across agencies, very important. I love the idea of being champions of experimentation, but that does come back to the idea of risk. If, if UHA finds a project failed because it was risky, but we learned something, it failed, didn't it? And so the agencies are really nervous about that. So how innovation, risk, appetite, interleaf, important to think about. Um, I did throw out the idea of, you have guidance on gender, can you do this? I understand what you don't have, but at least that has been, in a sense, more mainstreamed for years. So I think we need to head down this path with environment. Um, on disease, I'll stick around and we can talk more uh, uh, about that in the break. But 
um, the simplest explanation is that, you know, diseases that had been held in reservoirs of animals jump to either humans or to livestock, and some of the normal mechanisms of keeping them under control disappear, and we have a global economy which moves everything around really fast. So most of the pandemics now have been linked to this degradation of environment in one shape or another and allowing that kind of jumping, but I'm happy to talk more about that. And um, uh, on, on the accountability, I, the one of the last comments was, I, I think we have to make a conscious effort to report not just on the, uh, did we achieve the outcome of a project, but what were the co-benefits? And, and Jeff, for example, is struggling now with what small number of co-benefits should we require um, come into being in Jeff 8 and 9 so that we're not missing health, we're not missing livelihoods, and just reporting on environment. So again, I think Eileen's keep it simple, but think about this as a, a, a broader universe, yet keep your aperture focused on your issue can allow us to make progress. Eileen? I think Rosina answered so many of the questions. I'm not even going to try other than I, I will say I, I'm not familiar with the Brazzaville Payment for Ecosystem um, Services Project to be able to help in specifics. But I will say that I know for us on Payment for Ecosystem Services, this whole approach of being able to um, document the context and lo look across so many of these projects, because so much is about were the conditions there in the first place, right, to make the project sensible, as well as the structure. And then maybe the other point that I'd connect back to that at least for us has sometimes been a caution flag about where PES is appropriate, Rosina's point about behavior change. There are actually a lot of um, behavior science studies out there that talk about where um, payments for ecosystem services actually can push in the wrong direction, right? Because it essentially is, is, uh, is counterproductive relative to the intrinsic valuation sometimes that these societies and cultures hold. So I think it's an interesting area to explore. Maybe the last thought that I will just end on is connect I think points two of you made on the, the notion of evaluation as an intervention within an intervention and the notion that this is about just creating moments of reflection, right? And and that took me back to, you know, we're working on a project called Legacy Landscapes in partnership with the German Development Bank, the French Development Bank, and others. And um, what we've concluded there is, you know, yes, the support we can provide to these protected area sites at large landscape scales is valuable, but maybe even the more valuable thing that we can do is looking across all these sites, you know, teach some, or learn something about the uh, economics of the buffer zones and how they connect to the performance of the protected areas. So we've really designed the evaluation of legacy landscapes to just be able to shed light on, on that interesting question. And many of us have often said that, you know, that may turn out to really be the legacy of legacy landscapes, That's right, given, yeah. given what a gap it is. So I, I think you're on to something in thinking about these interventions that can create a moment of reflection. Let me just make one one uh, information point, which is that, so like uh, Rosina was saying, that um, we have this issue with uh, risk appetite, and we have an um, active discussion with our council about what is an acceptable rate of, of um, uh, risk and failure and so on. But um, I'm looking at my colleague Senya, who is sitting uh, uh, behind there, because she's managing currently an evaluation that we are doing on learning from challenges, we call it, but uh, I like to call it learning from failures, where we are looking at the, at the, at projects that um, uh, didn't really make it, but uh, but uh, but something happened and something uh, useful came out of it, uh, actually. So that's interesting. Uh, keep you posted on that. I think we are out of time uh, quite badly, and uh, and um, uh, we'll continue during the coffee breaks and and lunch breaks and 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 receptions and whatever have you. But so let me thank uh, Yuha and and our distinguished panelists for an excellent an excellent really conversation, a very timely one. We really appreciate the timeliness of your intervention. Uh, of course. Um, I think there are some low-hanging fruits that uh, drive our action, like uh, uh, updating our uh, normative framework for including this. I think is really something that we need to move uh, forward. Learn as well from other practices, as you mentioned, from what we did for gender equality. Uh, there are a lot of lessons uh, that can be integrated into really uh, raising the awareness about the 
environment uh, crisis that we are facing. And the clock is ticking, not just for, for the, our coffee break, mm -hmm. but also for the window of opportunity that we have uh, in order to have really transformative actions that can uh, correct course uh, and try to avoid the, the disasters uh, that uh, uh, unattending uh, this uh, effects may, may cause. Therefore, uh, please uh, join me in a round of applause for this uh, fantastic panel and for the organizers. We have pushed the, the coffee break until 11.30, so we'll come back uh, here 11.30, please. Thanks very much.